But cool. So um, let's just get to the agenda today. There's a few things that uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, mainly things that we've all spoken individually about and some uh, ideas and some decisions that have been made. So um, uh, let's start off by uh, talking about cost. So I, I have Bishal's PR uh, open in front of me because I think it's going to be a good uh, starting point. Uh, as most of you already know, uh, Bishal has been working throughout the month on uh, the cost calculation for the CloudFront distributions and functions. But um, through his work and through the collaboration with Azan, they realized that there was a lot of... Uh, um, kind of difficulties when it comes to accurately uh, grabbing, like aggregating the, the cost. I think in this particular case, uh, the CloudFront distributions calculates cost um, um, against the source of the request and depending on the edge location from where the request comes from, there's a different pricing that goes in, into it. But as um, a developer trying to calculate that cost, uh, it turns out that AWS doesn't um, expose the locations of those uh, edge location clusters, therefore leading it to be <laughs> almost impossible to calculate accurately, um, at least through that method. So. This is kind of like a microcosm of what we're more than likely going to find in um, a bunch of different uh, services for AWS. And more than likely, we're going to find uh, these uh, difficulties, these roadblocks in the other big uh, cloud providers such as uh, GCP and Azure. So through a conversation with Mohammed, through a conversation also with Azan, um, uh, and also um, through the conversation that we're going to have now, we wanted to propose a way forward. Again, feel free to challenge us, but we want to potentially stop thinking about uh, offering cost metrics at the resource level because it's going to be as well. Let me rephrase that. We're not. We're, we will um, offer cost calculation at the resource level if it's easy if it's possible. So say, for example, the Civo cost API makes it incredibly easy for us to um, share cost calculations at the resource level. And where that's possible, we'll make a determination at the at the cloud provider level. So for, say, for example, Civo, DigitalOcean, those are easy uh, cloud providers to deal with. But GCP uh, and AWS, we definitely know that it's not straightforward. And people that are going to come and uh, use Commissar and depend on Commissar uh, or even compare the metrics that they see on Commissar against the metrics that they see in their own Cost Explorer in either GCP or AWS, they're going to be frustrated because it's never going to be accurate. There's these kind of like rough, hard-coded solutions that we can try to give, but they're just never going to be satisfactory. So long story short, we're going to go for um, offering service level uh, cost aggregations. So how are we going to do that and how are we going to circumvent the issues, for example? Because if we, if we offer at the service level, you might rightly think like, yeah, but we're going to have the same issue. But uh, we're going to do it in a different way and we're going to leverage the um, Cost Explorer API. Now, there's a few kind of like layers of difficulty or not so much difficulty, but questions that we're going to need to ask ourselves because there is a cost for calling the Cost Explorer API. So the idea is we can try to be as transparent as possible with um, call outs, with uh, toasters or with um, um, like filtering options, uh, sorry, with a uh, toggling options of cost calculations on, on Commissar. And we can say to the user, hey, would you like to see service level uh, cost um, metrics on the Commissar dashboard? If so, you can toggle here. And if you toggle there, say for example, you will uh, will make clear to them that there will be some small uh, cost associated with, with, with those uh, calls. That's what we feel at the moment is the best way forward when it comes to cost. Uh, insights for Commissar. I'm going to stop there and just open it up to um, 
to the team here to see what does what, does that sound okay to you? Is there anything that comes to mind? I see that Kunal has a question here. Might be a best basic question, but what would be the difference between being resource level and being service level? Totally valid question. So um, the the difference between the service and the resource is that, uh, the, for example, EC2 is the service. So we would aggregate all of the EC2 uh, resources, all of the EC2 instances, and we would say, hey, all of the EC2 instances in whatever account equates to $200. So we're not going to say specifically which uh, which EC2 instance cost specifically how much, but at least we'll be able to give uh, them the 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 idea of where the majority of uh, so so it's kind of like a the first approach insight into cost. So say for example they'll know that that hey I'm actually spending a lot on RDS uh, instances. We'll be able to give them that, but we won't be able to tell them exactly which instance in particular is is costing exactly how much. Does that make sense? Uh, I know Kunal is right there. Feel free to to turn on the mic if you're free to talk. Yeah, I thought I was writing too much there. I mean, uh, from what I understand is, for example, let's say EC2, right? So the resources which are, are associated with EC2, let's say a security group, right? And let's say, you know, other resources which are also associated with EC2. So those won't be visible, but the total cost that would be visible uh, with the EC2 resource, that that would that is the only thing that would be showing on the dashboard. Is that correct? Or I'm going wrong here? No, no, we'll still keep showing each resource. So, so because the most important thing that um, we want to um, share as uh, for Commissar, and this kind of applies to Telewarden too, the most important thing is resource transparency. We want to be able to show every like every user exactly what's inside of their resource at the at the, at the resource level. But the thing is, for them to take that extra step f to give the specifically how much they're paying for each one of those resources we're seeing that for aws it's going to be complicated it's going to be uh, bespoke it's going to be very custom to each one so we're going to take one step back when it comes to cost and we're not going to worry about specifically how much the ec2 um a sorry the ec2 instance a costs we're just going to say all of the EC2 instances that you have, they cost $250, for example. And even though there are other resources, say, for example, security groups that kind of like fall inside of the of the compute, or, sorry, inside, like when you kind of like fire up an EC2 instance, other resources come along with it. I, I'm not including those into the, the cost because the thing is, EBS volumes, they are also... Uh, include they're also like fired up by default when you provision an ec2 instance but i would separate those when it comes to the aggregation because ebs volumes also come with their own cost so say for example if if you delete an ec2 instance but you don't delete the ebs volume you're going to be charged for that so we definitely want to be able to give that layer of cost kind of insights but without saying hey, that EBS volume B, which is in re region um, US East 1, costs exactly this much. D does that make sense? Yeah, yep, makes sense. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so if, if, if the maintainers here, and then we'll, we'll also check in with Shubham and, and Philip that they're not here, but if, if that's okay with everyone, then that's going to be the uh, path that we're going to set um, for the upcoming, yeah, just from here on in. And then that's going to kind of, um, that's going to determine some of the different uh, features and some of the different solutions that we're going to want to start working on. Because for example, 
we're going to want to make it as clear as possible that if we are leveraging the Cost Explorer API, we want the users to know that. We don't want <laughs> a lot of times people that are looking for tools like Commissar and Tailwarden, they're going to be looking they're, like they're cost conscious, you know, so we definitely don't want them to come along to, te- to Commissar fire it up and at the end of the month realize wait a minute did did this just cost me more money than uh, than i had to spend at the beginning of the month so yeah so to be careful with that so that that was the first data point sorry that was the first uh, agenda item that i had and um, if it's uh, if it's clear and if nobody else has any uh, thoughts we can move on um cool thanks and by the way um yeah, just let me know if you need to, if you want to speak, because I don't know if you all have permission to. But anyway, second item is um, through a conversation that I had with uh, Bishal, which is that Bishal is interested in helping out with the Tencent uh, integration. So uh, let me just have a quick look. Um, I'm not too sure, but almost for sure, the Tencent uh, provider integration that we have now is uh, quite sparse and yeah as we can see here we just have it initially integrated but we only have instances uh, supported so Bashal has shown interest in helping us out here so um, uh, yeah Bashal said that he's been looking through the issues Bashal have you found anyone in particular that you'd like to uh, work on just going to invite you to speak uh, just just let us know if you can't speak at the moment. Yeah, so, okay, so yeah, you're looking into it. Uh, but yeah, let us know if there's any issues that you do come up with or... Uh, oh, go ahead, I, I can see that you can speak now. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. I was just looking forward to some issues uh, to just get started with my working on. But uh, uh, so so basically, currently I'm uh, I'm looking into some some sort of basic things of the Tencent Tencent Cloud, and I can see only one instance is existing for now on the commissary repo. But yeah, I'm looking into some you know some of the issues which which already been opened uh, to get started with my work on. And we'll let you know there, like from which one we can start. Like, I can see plenty of issues uh, has been opened. So yeah, looking into it. Perfect. And we'll yeah, let you know soon. That's that's great. And yeah. let us know also, I don't know if we actually have a Tencent account, but if you do need one to test out some of the features that you're going to be supporting, some of the services that you're going to be supporting, let us know and we can potentially fire up a a Tencent account for testing. I hope so. I'll be needing one to testing purpose. Yeah. Exactly. Perfect. So uh, thanks a minute for that. So moving on. Uh, I also wanted just to quickly touch on the fact that uh, there was a contributor um, who is also a Commissar user who told us that he and his team um, heavily leverage the code suite um, the code suite uh, set of services. So I just fired up uh, at the beginning of the week these um, these issues. It, it turns out that there, we have one contributor uh, who's um, Subajit20 who has um, shown interest, uh, even though he is going to need some help to get going. Uh, I'm, go- I'm going to push him in the direction of um, starting off with at least um, AWS code build or code pipelines first, since um, those are a little kind of like higher priority um, inside of the code suite. But if anyone kind of like uh, pops up on your radar, or if you see anybody who's willing to start um, contributing to Commissar, if you could push some of these uh, code suite issues, uh, these are great, good first issues. They're not too uh, difficult, so um, th- so that would be great. Hey, say, how's it going? Good to see you. Um, so so yeah. Oh, and also say, I don't know if uh, you're working on anything at the moment, but if you did want to uh, pick something up, um, any of these uh, AWS code 
Artifact, Code Star, Code Deploy, these are, are great ones that would be really nice to support. Um, cool. Moving on, uh, unless anyone has anything else there, um, is uh, something that we were talking about recently with Azan. Uh, this is the um, idea of having a place, having an official place to showcase not only the uh, badges that people are going to be able to earn as commissar contributors, but also maybe kind of like a, a members, uh, I don't know, I, I kind of came up with this name, but we can co completely change it, but kind of like a Hall of Fame or something like that. Um, uh, Shub, um, Azan shared some uh, examples of other communities that have kind of a wall of the different avatars of the different contributors by clicking on the avatar you gain access to their profile and right there in the profile you can see the badges that each uh, contributor has earned over uh, the time of participating at a, at a project and this is something that i think that would be really really great for us to uh, offer also because now that we're going to be uh, the design team has been hard at work coming up with a list and uh, started working to get the badges developed. I think it's going to be a pity if we don't have some kind of place to showcase uh, the badges. So um, um, Azan also came up with the idea. Let me have a quick look here. Yeah, layer5.io, they're, they're a great example of, of, yeah, exactly. So we have here. The, the, the person, we just uh, click on their profile and we can see the badges they have here. They're free to uh, update their, their profile here. So the question that I had for you, because I already put this to Mohammed and to the design team, they're completely on board, but now the idea is just the best way to go forward. Um, I, I see that Layer 5 has this community page and members page embedded into their uh, landing page. Um, if we look at our landing page, it's at commissar.io, but it's, but sorry, this is, it went over to the commissar.io. But the thing is, commissar.io is built on Webflow, and Webflow um, is not necessarily kind of like the most, uh, the, the, probably not the best place to um, add this kind of um, page. What, uh, Mohammed said is potentially adding a section on the readme or uh, even better could be um, a solution that we leverage GitHub pages. Um, Azan, do, do you do you think it could be possible to do on GitHub pages and then maybe like link to the landing page in some way? Uh, sorry, I don't know if you have, we can, yeah. But um, yeah, so to be honest, whichever is easiest, I'm guessing would be the best way to go. I, I think uh, the design team expressly asked to find an alternative to Webflow because uh, it would be kind of uh, difficult. Yeah, uh, I think like we can, okay, we can add uh, our um, GitHub pages website the Hall of Fame website as uh, uh, in the subdomain of commissar.io. I think that's pretty doable. And then from Webflow's, uh, uh, like it will have a link in Webflow, like blog has a link or any other, like stars navigates to our GitHub repo. It will have that link, which will uh, navigate to that subdomain, Hall of Fame.commissar.io which will have our GitHub pages are deployed there. That's perfect. That, that would be perfect. Yeah. To have it hosted over on GitHub pages and just to have it uh, linked to the subdomain of, of commissure.io. That would be perfect. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to add that here. Um, Uh, perfect. So um, do you think the best way forward there would be to write up an issue on, on GitHub? Or maybe do you want to take that initiative, Azan? Uh, uh, Avinesh can help with automations. Um, let's create like a, you know, let's discuss a couple of approaches right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then like 
I'll create a repo. Okay, I'll uh, take Avinash on board with all the automations uh, that will be required for uh, you know awarding badges. I think he's already on that. Okay, the awarding badges part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like but before uh, we jump on that, like let's discuss a couple of approaches here. GitHub Pages natively supports Jekyll. Okay. Although we can like have any other static website there, it natively supports Jekyll. Like, do you do we want to go any other way, or like, do we want to go Jekyll, with Jekyll? So, what's the alternative to Jekyll? Like any other static site. Like, even if you write pure HTML, CSS, that also works. If you use uh, the one with Go, I don't remember. I think it was what was it hugo yeah hugo you can use that as well um i have no no preference uh at all like it it's really like it it doesn't really matter for it you know, I'll use this. It's just a choice that we have to make either way. Yeah. See, a lot of a lot of people, uh, the CNCF community uses. Uh, I don't know if that yeah, is like, in, 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 not uh, very happy with it or not. But I, for fact, they use a lot of you uh, So maybe we can go for that. Or maybe mm-hmm. I can ask people around if it is good enough to maintain for a longer run. Like this uh, layer 5.io, it uses Jekyll. Okay. So like it's, it's kind of a, you know, it, it's kind of just about like it, it, the management of uh, both of them are going to be very similar because both of them support Markdown, okay, that's how we, we are going to be writing those. It's not going to be that different. Okay, it's like, it's just a choice that we have to make. Like, while writing anything in Jekyll, we don't really have to write anything in Ruby. And same is with Hugo, like, we don't really have to write anything in Go either. Like, you, you can do it without knowing Go. Yeah. No, uh, that's that's the that's the important thing that o- other people can maintain it also or or update it. Um. So so yeah. So at least yeah. Let's just narrow it down to Hugo and 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 Jekyll. Um. And if you want, maybe we can. Because uh, I'm guessing the only because the thing is there's a bunch of different. Uh, tools that we can use for the same thing, but I'm guessing just the most important uh, uh, kind of thing here is like, which is the easiest to maintain and which one is going to give us the least amount of headaches and which is going to be the most stable. So maybe do we want to just um, do a bit of research and, and come up with a decision on which one to use tomorrow in the Commissar Weekly? Sure, sure. Like I, I don't have an issue. Like I, I, I literally uh, use Jekyll for my own blog site as well. Like it's not, it's not a headache either. Like I have used Hugo previously as well. It's, that's not a headache either. So like there is no headache in either of those. Yeah, yeah. So I think, um, yeah. Let's just not overthink it, and let's just um have a a look through. Um, all in our own time and let's just have a quick look I'm just going to have a quick look at the kind of like maintainability but to be honest I I don't think it's going to be uh, too difficult um, mm. uh, Kunal said uh, I have a... go, go ahead yeah so I had a question regarding it like uh, if, if we want do we want like how uh, put this way how do we want the the contributors to on the side is it the we we define a threshold of contribution or we do some rankings and how is that thing going to be happening 
Yeah, it's a good question. So I think for each badge, and I, I hope this is what you were asking, but each badge should have its own um, kind of acceptance criteria. And the, and the most important thing is, like, let's try and make all of that ac ac acceptance criteria um, um, automated. So it's the, all the, uh, the acceptance criteria is kind of based on um, some sort of action on GitHub, be it like closed PRs, um, closed PRs with um, certain labels, for example. So um, if we're given a doc badge, well, it's because they closed two doc related issues or something like that. Another thing that um, Azan also brought up, because the thing is, we also want to offer some content rate related badges and some pot potentially non code related uh, badges. But the way that we could potentially uh, include that to fall into some sort of automated action would be to if somebody send uh, like writes a blog post or something like that, maybe to open a PR that like shares it and like maybe like adds the blog post to some sort of like list of blog posts that were generated by by contributors or something like that. So, um, but yeah, so f to have badge level criteria that's automatable, if that makes sense. Yeah, I was thinking the same way, but for that, and I believe the, the, the site that we are going to build is going to be a separate repo, right? Uh, and what I'm considering right now, and this is just a very rough idea of what I'm thinking, which is we, uh, we, we look into an organization level uh, thing, and uh, I don't know if we are storing those uh, blogs or any of these uh, things, in the organization and in, in, in the github itself or not but if we do we can look after the uh, at our organizational level scope and see and put on a list of contributors who are doing it and then some calculation over there then the github opens a pr to the website directly which on merge will be uh the deploying and all those things happens by itself so things will be totally automated Uh, go ahead, Kunal, but yeah, I, I totally agree with you, um, Avinash. Yeah, I mean, I agree uh, with what Avinash said. I mean, what we can do for the blogs is, this is something that I've been thinking for quite a while. If, for example, some contributor from outside wants to you know, write blogs for Commissar, right? Maybe covering different use cases of Commissar. So we can have them open a PR to that repo and we can have a separate table for that particular PR and that's how we can track the number of contributors who have made blog contributions let's say I mean this is something that uh, we can relate that to the labels for that particular uh, PR that was made this is something that we can do with the blogs but I am not really sure how can this be done if they want to contribute a video let's say blog is something that we can do like this you know, tracking those tables those particular tables but this, the video part is something that we got to discuss. So uh, one thing I'd like to say is uh, like any kind of content, okay, whoever is creating the content wants to get traction on it. Like it's an obvious thing, like a writer wants people to read what he has written and a video creator wants to see his video. So we are just providing them a way to, uh, you know, get their blog post okay their article their video to be listed and kind of featured uh from our side okay like you know content this month or writer of the month or like whatever we can write you know to get them traction so that that's why they will create a pr okay pr with just a link okay not a video nothing just a link with their video and we are going to keep a list in our repo that these are our um, these are our content contributions okay these are the videos and these are the blog posts articles yeah exactly because i i think you know the way the same way that we have a change log for the different releases maybe on the 
on the kind of like badges or the members repo, we can have a list, which is kind of like the content change log. And for each month, we can share all of the blogs that were written and all of the videos that were that were published. Now, these are just the links. And that's what's going to be the content of the PR. Because to be honest, I think it would be a little bit difficult to change, for example, where the blogs are housed today, which is on Webflow, you know. So if we were to t like extract the commissar blogs and put them on, that that would I, I think uh, uh, that would be a little bit uh, overkill. So yeah, so we can um, have a process so I can speak to the to the person who has created the the content. So I can either post the blog post on Webflow or post the video on 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 our YouTube channel, or it could even be on their own YouTube channel. Like it, it, it doesn't have to be all kind of, uh, and to be honest, it could even be the same with the, with the blog. It could be on their own blog, um, platform. And the thing is we just link it. We have the change log of all the content that was created that, that month. And, and the automations come from there. I was about to say the exact same thing. Like we don't really have to have every single blog that, uh, that has been a community contribution to be on Tail Wardens or Commissar's site. It can be on like Hashnode or Dev.2 or their own blog site. It can be wherever. And we'll just like, you know, give them a link. Totally agree. Yeah, that's perfect. So if we are all aligned, I see Sayi is writing. Uh, hi, Jake. Would the maintainers also be part of the contributors group? Yeah, of course, a, a maintainer is a is is a contributor still. Um, um, or, or 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 do you mean the other way around? Do the are are contributors part of the maintainers group? Is is that what you mean? Um, but in the meantime, at least uh, w let's just sleep on uh, Jekyll versus Hugo, and let's all, if we have time, uh, have a look at it and make a decision tomorrow. But in the meantime, Zan, if you could just fire up that uh, repo, which we can then rename or see what what we come up with, and and yeah, and get it going. We already have a good few members here, and um, I already have all of your avatars, all of your um, images, so I, I might be able to start um adding some profiles there and yeah that's gonna I be have, fun uh, one more question uh, regarding this uh, website okay <laughs> uh, no you can't do that because i'm going to do that <laughs> so uh yeah what was my question yeah so is uh, uh, the tail warden design team going to design this website for us or like, are, are we going to do that ourselves or like, you know, that's what the layer five people do. They have like designers, community contributors, like designers as community contributors who, you know, help around in that stuff. And like, some people are not even like designers, like we are coders, but like we discuss and like, you know, fiddle around with Figma. Uh, yeah, I think we, all of us here, we're all Figma fiddlers, uh, but I, I don't think we're necessarily <laughs> going to make something too too beautiful. <laughs> so so yeah, so we're definitely going to lean on the design team. So today I, I'm going to write up a, a ticket to, to get them going. I'm just going to tell them that we've decided that it's going to be hosted on, on GitHub. And yeah, depending on, on which framework we choose, they're going to be able to uh, but the thing is, the good thing now is that if we do choose uh, Jekyll, we can I, I can easily just send them the layer five example and and they can use that as inspiration. Uh, and if not, if we go f with Hugo, then it would be cool if we could get some examples of sites built with Hugo and then, then we can shoot it over to them and hopefully they'll be able to get something designed in a timely fashion. I mean, this can be a possibility. I'm not sure if it can be, but I I suppose that the, someone from the design team would know a framework that we could use in this particular use case, which can be, which according to them would be more optimized.
to build this don't you think about this maybe when you message the design team you can also ask this additional question as well I, I can definitely ask but just so you know that with our particular design team it's usually been the other way around we tell them the framework we give them uh, examples of things that are built on that framework and and then they take it from there um i think they're they're pretty good designers but they they don't have that much knowledge into the different uh frameworks but i can definitely ask yeah makes sense i have something in my head. okay i have never been a designer okay i look down upon them very much <laughs> but but uh, my question is like does it matter to a designer which framework is being used kind of yeah because the thing is um they're going to oh well to be honest if we're talking about markdown and we're talking about mm -hmm. this kind of stuff then no but say for example when we were uh when they helped design the visual assets and like the different like spacing for all the different um yeah just the different visual elements on the documentation so uh, i forget the name of the of the doc platform that it that is running on now but they needed various uh, examples to see what's possible on that framework. Mintlify, sorry, yeah, thanks, thanks for that. So, so yeah. Mm. But to be honest, yeah, I think since this is going to be uh, Markdown, it's going to be pretty simple, like avatars that just open up and 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 different squares for for JPEGs, which is, which is going to be the 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 badges. I think it's pretty straightforward. And um, and yeah, and who knows? Maybe someday you're you're gonna really get into it as an, and you end up becoming a designer. Never say never. <laughs> um, that, that's one. That's one time when I'm gonna say never. <laughs> okay. You okay. have seen my drawings. Okay. Do you really want to? Do you really want someone like that to design a website? Hey, no one, no one can say that those drawings are not creative. And if um, any of you haven't seen Azan's drawings, he's very happy. You know what? He might even add his drawings to his Hall of Fame profile. So, um, um, oh, that, if, if that's, you all... uh, that's not going to be that's a contribution that anyone is going to like. <laughs> People are going to be uh, weirded out by, okay, I thought Commissar did something else. What's happening here? Yeah, well... It turns out that uh, Commissar is the land of the free and the land of the creative. Uh, but uh, thanks, uh, thanks everyone. Yeah, I who, think, who but like more. that's quite a, uh, you know, allowing people to add other stuff as well. Uh, like it's kind of obvious, like allowing them to have their own links, like LinkedIn and Twitter and YouTube links. Yeah. Okay, but it would be quite fun for them to like add their own, like you know. <laughs> something else like like a mood said, board. like i could uh, yeah all, all valid idea yeah let's uh, let's explore um, as many ideas as as possible and let's uh, write it up and get it over to the design team but yeah for now on uh, from from now at least i'm going to tell them what we've decided uh, in terms of plate where we're going to host and hopefully we'll be able to move forward there at least to get the ball rolling and take a decision tomorrow on the framework. Uh, just so we don't spend too much time, I don't want to take uh, much more time of the, everyone that's here. I just have one more uh, item to talk about. And um, and feel free if anyone here has any items, um, either write them in the chat or, or, or jump on the mic. But the last thing that I had is uh, something that Kunal brought up, which is thinking about a section potentially in the documentation where we go into and explore different uh, tutorials for different use cases. This is something that I think is very, very useful and something that I think we should, uh, uh, at least I should spend some time thinking on what kind of use cases do we want to uh, promote and what kind of like solutions do we want to be able to help people uh, find quickly and accessibly uh, through Commissar. So something that uh, comes to mind is that um, there's certain use cases around um, f using uh, either Commissar level tags or 
or contributor, sorry, or cloud provider layer tags to be able to build um, team based um, custom views. And by doing that, the commissar admin is able to see exactly what's being uh, used and leveraged by each uh, team. So I think if we could um, slowly start kind of like building a kind of small repository of different use cases, because the thing is, sure, cloud transparency and insights is cool. And yeah, sure, we're going to be able to like, like you, but use that as, as much as we want, but it's quite open. It's, a, it's an open kind of concept, cloud transparency. So if we can kind of like narrow it down into tutorials for specific things. So say, for example, using the, the custom webhook integration, like what particular automations do we want to promote? So say, for example, if uh, the cost goes over a certain amount, maybe we can show them how to, um, through the custom webhook, turn off uh, an EC2 instance or something like that. Maybe that's a little bit too uh, encroaching too much on their and their uh, resources, but different different uh, ideas like that. Um, so, so yeah. So Kuna, thanks for coming up with the for promoting the idea of coming up with tutorials. But uh, I think now what we can probably do, I don't know either in the content creation um, channel or 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 somewhere else on the Discord server, but to come up with ideas of different use cases. Maybe they, maybe we might need to like speak with, with more users and see exactly how they're using Commissar, how they get value from it, and and then build more content that way. Um, yeah, one, uh, sorry to cut you, you yeah. were saying. No, go ahead, please. Okay, thanks. Uh, one question that I had related to this, so, and I would love uh, everyone's thoughts here as well who are in the chat or who, who can speak. Uh, initially, my ideology of coming up with the idea was for beginner contributors, more you know, centric to beginner contributors who are just starting out. Because I sometimes see that you know, a tool is being, there is a tool, for example, I go to their documentation, I see how to install and how to do stuff. But there aren't any, there aren't many projects that show actual use case of that particular tool in a real life project. And from creating tutorials and from writing blogs, I've seen people actually, especially beginners, actually relate to that open source tool when it's being used in a real project, right? When it's been integrated with certain tools from the ecosystem and it's actually doing something, right? Rather than just working separately and running it out in a local system. So initially my idea was that the, the tutorials that we come up with should be very simple to implement and very short to implement, right? And uh, each tutorial should be focused on separate features of commerce. Like you mentioned, the webhooks integration. Uh, and one can be, you know, th this is the initial idea that I had. One can be using the alerts feature of commerce, right? But the projects should be short uh, to understand and easy to implement. But Shubham, uh, you know, came up with other, another idea of, you know, talking to commissers end users and knowing from them how are they using commissar and covering those type of use cases. So I believe that those type of use cases would sort of be for different audience, right? That, uh, in that particular thing, we'll be covering the production use cases of commissar particularly. And the first part of the things where I was covering was trying to cover the beginner level of uh, the beginner level projects. Those would be other use cases. So I want to know how the ideas that we'll be coming up with, I, I would really want to know, like we, we can maybe brainstorm it together uh, to set up the kind of, not sure, kind of a, let's say ideology in which direction we want to do. So the project should be focused on beginners or commissar end users. I mean, what should be the ideas that we come up with should be focused on. I hope, I, I know I, I, might, I might sound a little bit confused here, but I hope you understood my point and I would love to know the thoughts for, from everyone. 
let me know if it confused you i can rephrase it is it, is it true that we're, we're potentially talking about two different things and let me know if, if this is true so one of them is i'm just gonna write it here just so you so one of them are use cases and the other one are projects because the thing is with use cases, we can keep it like super simple. And like here in the guides, for example, we could just have like a section which is just called use cases. I can, and it can just as easily be like a small article here, maybe like even a, a, a video. But we keep it really, really simple. But we just talk about specific use cases of ways to get insights and ways to um, like leverage specific transparency with Commissar. But then the other thing is projects. So say, for example, someone who wants to uh, like yeah practice like putting a bunch of different uh, tools together so like building a simple app and then deploying it to a certain cloud provider maybe even a, 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 a some sort of kubernetes cluster having that all in like um, infrastructure as code part of the things that are going to be deployed is also an instance of of commissar to so that's kind of like a, a different thing, not necessarily a use case. Like it's, you wouldn't need to do that if you're just a simple commissar user, right? So I don't know if it makes sense to separate just maybe like a use cases section and projects or... Yeah, I mean, initially the idea was for projects, I would say, because that is what I believe would, would actually show a newcomer how Commissar can be integrated with certain system, right? And do the thing that Commissar is great at doing. This is something that I saw. I haven't, uh, as I mentioned previously, I haven't seen many projects do this, but I still remember that I was looking at one of the projects and that was the very first time in their documentation, they had an entire section of projects, small, small projects, uh, or which, basically show different ways in which that tool was being used with other tools as well, right? And that was, that were end-to-end -end projects. And I actually tried one or two, pro building one or two projects and that really got me up to speed with what the tool is capable of and what it, what it can do as a beginner. I really don't remember the name, but it really helped me. And that's how initially I got, I came up with this idea that we should maybe have kind of this section, but yeah, I mean, projects i believe would be very lengthy in my opinion uh, to keep in a documentation it's a separate section but yeah i mean we can discuss it uh, it's not clear but yeah the initial idea was projects end to end projects yeah perfect i like the idea a lot i, I think uh, use cases is something kind of different so maybe we can reserve use cases for another conversation and, and another section but yeah I, I totally see the value in having projects also because um, there's a bunch of different ways that commerce can be used we, you can like use it with, with a helm chart we can use it with uh, a, a docker image we can use like self-hosted you can put it into a, a kubernetes cluster and then so just the different ways of deploying it then there's like a complete like it, there's an infinite amount of different combinations that of, of other tools that we can use to integrate it with. I mean, there will be some sort of limit because it's not like, because I'm guessing like a tool like Zapier, for example, that really is limitless. Like you can just kind of connect a bunch of different tools and just create a bunch of different uh, projects from there. But I do think that there is a good dozen projects that we could potentially come up with and i think that that's definitely a good uh, use of our time so so yeah i think let's um think of a, a few projects let's put them into the content creation plan uh which we have on notion um so either any of us can pick one of them up or, or start working on them and, and see which which are the best projects to kind of start with if that makes if that works yeah i mean one counterpoint to this you know people can say that why not write a separate blog for a project you're creating? Why just include it in the documentation? So here, here is where we got to brainstorm and think of simple and small projects that we can put directly into the documentation, documentation and which highlights the specific features of Commissar. Each project 
highlights a specific feature of commerce so that is the aim or goal or the vision that i'm going for right now and that is where we got to brainstorm a little because this can definitely be a counterpoint and we definitely i mean i remember you giving an example of the ansible and terraform project that i that i created and wrote a blog about so that is in my opinion a very big project to be included in the documentation and that is an app project if you are writing a separate tutorial blog but here on the documentation section if you are you know trying to build a separate section i would really want right now the the main idea that i would love to see would be small projects and each project showing different features of commercial highlighted so there is that is where we got to you know brainstorm a little bit of how we can come up with such projects easily digestible perfect yeah so um cool yeah i think uh yeah i hope everyone understood the idea i, I was just hay wiring up it in between i think it's clear um unless uh, if anyone else has anything to add there please feel free to jump into the conversation but uh, i think that's pretty clear let's um dedicate a section maybe a thread in the content creation channel to talk about those small projects that highlight a feature of commissary i think that's going to be really really useful thanks million for that and we can do it asynchronously maybe we might have some ideas to talk about tomorrow in the commissary weekly but if not no worries um yeah we've been uh, going for close to an hour now i think so um thanks a million to everyone for taking the time that these are all the agenda points that i had myself if anyone has anything else that they would like to add um speak now feel free but if not we can leave it there um fun last minute thing i'm free from exam ping me for any help perfect so thanks a million for um helping avanesh so oh uh, actually avanesh there's one thing that uh, that just comes to mind now um if you're free and you have a chance to check out the uh, civo logo that is missing in the resource dependency graph i don't know if you had a chance to look at mm -hmm. it um can you just get me the snapshot of your uh, db uh, where you have the what do we say um data about civo yeah, because i don't have any account about it uh, of civo so it would be hard for me to test in fact i just pinged you with the same like get me the snapshot of the db where you have the data and i'll, I'll check it right now I'll I'll just I'll just give you my 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 uh, API key, and you can oh, you can access. Oh, that's that's open. Yeah. But don't go crazy and start uh, provisioning a bunch of compute instances in my account or anything. Ooh. Thanks no. for reminding me. I would have gone for <laughs> multiple clusters. <laughs> <laughs> multiple clusters. Oh no. Um, cool. So um. Um. Yeah, so it looks like Kunal's going to ping you. Um, yeah, thanks a million. See, Zan is writing there, but um, if if we're all good, start minting BTC. Okay, no mining crypto. Okay, so let's. I just it's registered and this is going on YouTube, so um, I, I this will hold up in court. So no mining crypto. Okay, okay. Cool guys, thanks a million uh, for taking the time. Have a good one and uh, see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.